All right, guys. Well, I got a really good reloading question from a friend of mine here on YouTube, Guns Coast to Coast. Now, uh, first thing I'm going to tell you to do is if you'd like to stay on top of what's going on in the world uh, in a lot of different various subjects, you need to subscribe to uh, his channel. Uh, I'm going to leave a link below. Uh, do so. Uh, thank me later. All right, so he left a question on my reloading video about getting into reloading about how he noticed that there was an, the first ammo shortage that he noticed was in 2012. And after doing a little research, he realized there was also an ammo shortage in 2008. And now here we are again for a different reason. Now keep that in mind. These are different reasons. One was an election year. Uh, one was, uh, you know, possible gun ban legislation, election year, and now pandemic. So you got different reasons for the ammo shortage. Um, he identified three reasons that he thought people reloaded ammo. And one is like I do for match type ammo. You, you can't go out and get ammunition. But let me correct myself. You can get match grade ammunition from companies. There's actually even a pistol manufacturer person out there, uh, custom, that will t allow you to pick the primer, the powder, the charge weight, the bullet, the seating depth, everything. So it's like you're making your own custom ammo, but they're just doing it for you and sending it to you at the tune of about 40 cents a round versus, you know, about 13 cents a round. So to me, that's cost prohibitive. But so match ammo. Economic savings. Now let's talk about economic savings because in order for it to be a savings, you really have to have the free time to do it. So most people that argue for hoarding ammo don't have enough free time to dedicate to the craft of reloading. And people that reload generally have enough spare time on their hands or they enjoy it enough as a hobby to make time. So there's that time thing. So economic savings and then Three is sort of like the point I made of freedom. He identifies the fact that being your own manufacturer gives you freedom. Now, to that point, his main question was, do supplies dry up when ammo dries up? Because just here lately, if you go and try to buy ammunition at your local retailers, there's a stringent limit or it's just gone. If you go online, uh, you can find it coming back in stock now, but it disappears very, very quickly. People are worried about the law enforcement is already said they're not going to be there to protect you. So people have finally figured out that the right to keep and bear arms and having enough ammunition on hand to run those guns is an important thing. So kudos to those finally smart people in the world. So let's talk about the uh, raw materials. I think that basically boils down to him saying, well, should I hoard ammunition or stockpile ammunition, which I do stockpile ammunition and I stockpile raw uh, supplies for making ammunition because I shoot a lot. In, in, a, in a, a typical competition year, you're looking at 25,000 rounds. I mean, if you do the math of, shooting 2,000 rounds a month. I mean, that's simple math, figure it out. So to buy that much ammunition is really, really, really a lot of money, especially if you go the custom ammunition route. So right away for me, it's immediately about the cost savings. I really only have to devote 30 minutes a day, twice a week to crank out ammunition on either the 650 or the 1050 if I'm running, um, uh, the type of ammo that I need to run on that. So for me, it is absolutely about the cost. Now let's talk, I want to bring you guys in and let's talk a minute about the, the, the reality of what reloading really is, because there's a reason you don't see these machines for sale used a lot. A lot of times you'll find reloading equipment for sale online or something like that. And it's only because people are upgrading rarely will you talk to someone who got into reloading and says nah it just wasn't for me i'm selling all my crap once you realize you can make your own ammunition and how important it is uh, for certain guns to be able to do that you will absolutely keep that reloading equipment for a lifetime um all right so let's talk about um 
I guess it's just good camera angles in. I'll we'll pan down just a little bit. Sorry. Um, what I've got here is just an example. Okay, a quick example. I've got 223 brass that I've picked up off the ground, so it's free. And I've done the processing to it, and it's ready to be made in ammunition. Now, at this point in time, I have the flexibility to decide, am I going to put a, um, a little crappy little, you know, 55 grain bullet in there uh, for hosing. I, I call this hosing ammunition. So like at a three gun event, hosing on paper, uh, that's all you need. You don't want to spend an expensive a, a lot of money. Now, that same piece of brass, I can I can turn into my favorite, you know, three gun am, am, accurate ammo. It's a 69 grain uh, hollow point uh, boat tail. And now the couple of them are on the ground. Um, if I want to take that same piece of brass and that same primer, and I want to send something out five, six, seven hundred yards, I may opt for a um, tipped match king, 77 grain tipped match king which is arguably the most accurate bullet in the world um i can uh i can really step up my game and take that same piece of brass and these are expensive bullets here these are uh, some burger bullets these are 77 grain um hollow point boat tails uh, these are 75 grain I actually found a rifle these were not accurate in at all, uh, but they're supposedly very accurate bullets. Now, this big monster of a bullet is a 6.5 Creedmoor, okay? Now, if we get into ammunition like that, we've got brass uh, that we picked up for free. Now, this is, I call it free brass because I shot some match grade Hornady ammunition, and I was smart enough to pick up the brass, right? Um, again, you're gonna start to see a, a, uh, a, um, a theme here. Okay, that's 147 grain ELD bullet, which is very, very capable 6.5 Creedmoor. Uh, but they also make lighter uh, 6.5 uh, bullets. Right, so now I have options, and and then you're gonna to start to see a, a trend about options is really why we do this. Uh, 308. Now I've got plenty of 308 brass laying around. I can stick, and I've done this before, but don't ever do this out there, children. This is a bullet out of a Mosin Nagant 7.62 by 54R cartridge. I have shoved these through a resizing uh, press. And because these are 310 bore bullets, uh, 309 or whatever they are, you, <laughs> what I did was I squeezed these down to the right diameter. I actually loaded these up into a, a modern 308 cartridge. Don't do that. Um, but 175 grain uh, 308 bullets. I mean, let's face it, that's a badass round. If I wanted a commodity uh, 308 bullet, again, I would use a military surplus, 30 caliber, you know, maybe 147 grain, 150 grain bullet, what have you. Okay, so hoarding, I shouldn't say hoarding supplies. Hoarding supplies is a bad, bad word. I say stockpiling. The reason we stockpile parts instead of built ammunition is, 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 be, is because of those options. So I would rather have, again, a box of rifle primers, right? Or several boxes, a box of large uh, pistol primers. Large pistol primers, you're talking about, you know, your 44, uh, your bigger cartridges. Some, some of your 45 ACP has a large pistol, some of it has small pistol. But the small um, pistol primers that you say are hard to come by, by the way, I only use match grade primers when it's important. Um, that small pistol primer, now we can make 380, we can make nine millimeter, which is the same bullet, by the way, you start to see a, a trend there. You, you, uh, you can make 40 cal, you can make 45 ACP as long as it's a small primer 45. Uh, 
357, even though you're supposed to use a Magnum primer, 38 special. You know, now I've got primers for all the different guns that, that I own. I've got primer to make ammunition. I've got brass. I've got bullets set aside. Your blue bullets, um, your blue bullets, your coated bullet, that's a 38, that's for a 38 caliber uh, ammunition or 9 millimeter. Um, now, my friend Bad Billy out there is thinking about getting into this whole reloading thing. And he was talking about reloading for uh, 10 millimeter, which is expensive ammunition. Um, these are 180 grain, um, 40 cal, um, 10 millimeter, but they're also 40 cal. So in other words, the same dies on this press make 40 and 10 millimeter, okay? And these are some really nice, you know, hollow points. You know, it, it, some people say, I won't carry, I won't hunt with, uh, or I won't do anything important with, with, with my own reloaded ammunition. Well, I, I, I do. I don't mind whatsoever. I have no issue putting together self-defense ammunition with these bullets for either 10 millimeter or 40 cal. I just don't have a problem with it at all. Um, these are zero bullets. Uh, these are a full metal jacket. And these are a, uh, a bullet a lot of competitors use, uh, but these are defensive type uh, bullets. Okay, so I, I I could this video could go on and on and on and on and on. Um, but when you're talking about uh, don't the raw materials just dry up like the ammunition does? Yes, they do. To answer your question. The minute you see ammo fly off the shelves, the reloaders have the same knee-jerk reaction. And they're like, well, the last time primers went away, it took three years for primers to come back. Now, yes, I went out and bought some primers, but I'm not the kind of person that backs up the truck uh, because I keep a ton of inventory on hand because I constantly use inventory. Obviously, we all know the reason that ammunition flies off the shelf and the reloading supplies fly off the shelf is the guy that thought it was okay to just have a thousand primers. Now he wants all of a sudden, he wants 10,000 primers on hand. Where if you're like me and you keep 20, 30,000 primers, I mean a year's worth of primers ahead of time, you don't necessarily need to go out and buy 20,000 primers. Maybe you just went out and bought, you know, a couple thousand, 5,000, 10,000, what have you. Uh, the, the whole point is stock up when times, when everything's abundant, like uh, most people, most competition people do. Uh, eight pound jugs of powder will go a lot farther than a one single pound jug. I buy all of my pistol powder in, you know, in eight pound jugs. I've gotten back to shooting, you know, nine millimeter quite a bit in this sport pistol. You can buy it in singles or eights and I buy an eight pound jugs, it just uh, it just makes more sense. Uh, so I don't need to run down to the reloading store and buy a pound or a pound or two and then compete with all the mad rush of people out there doing that. I buy from companies online that I might buy 16 pounds at a time. Or, uh, you know, these come in a two pack. So you're buying 16 pounds of powder at a time. Now, let's say you've got to your supply of your primers, ammunition, powder, what have you. When will the stuff come back? That's really the last question people want to know. How much should you have on hand? I think about two years worth is pretty good supply because I feel like in a two-year time period, you can sort of like go, okay, things are going to come back or I'll eventually find things here and there and I'll pick them up a little to supplement. Or in that two-year time frame, you realize shit's not coming back and you change your lifestyle of shooting. You go to way more dry fire you only shoot ammunition at matches. You don't. You quit burning up 300 rounds a week in practice. It just is what it is. Maybe your skills fall off a little bit. So be it. We all go to matches to have fun. And to do what we do at matches, you have to have ammunition. So to do that, you've got to have a stockpile of primers, powders, brass you can always pick up anywhere. It's really least of my worries. Bullets as well, although bullets are pretty, they're, they don't seem to be as hard to come by as that primer, that almighty primer. So I don't know if this video actually answered the question. Hopefully it did.
but generally speaking, yes, the, the, the reloading supplies just, they disappear just like ammunition. So, uh, if you're looking for primers now, just, I say, keep looking, just keep looking when you can buy some, buy some, all that stuff's going to come back in stock. There's everything that's sold out at your large retailers. All that inventory is going to come back. I mean, the, the, the people that supply them aren't out yet. Okay, so you need to be watching for those supplies to come back in stock. When they do, try to buy enough to get you through a year or two and just hold on and, um, and create a stockpile, but keep the stockpile piled. When times are good, if you burn through 5,000, 10,000 primers, restock those 10,000 primers. That's what I did. I have a threshold, and when I get below it, I stock back up. Do I have to stock up right now? No, and that's kind of the whole point. So 16-minute video, uh, hopefully that was worth your time if you stuck through to the end. I just wanted to make sure I kind of covered this whole flexibility, options, and basically answering the overall question, do they disappear when, when ammo disappears? And yes, unfortunately, they do.